So our, our last session is going to be on human flourishing and uh, what it actually means and how do you study it and why is there a program at Harvard <laughs> looking into it. And those of us who've been involved in this kind of uh, movement, if you will, have been always looking for, like, what do we call this? Is it consciousness? Is it awareness? Is it healing? Is it... And uh, more and more, I've actually come up with the phrase human flourishing. Mm. So I actually would love to start with, like, what is human flourishing in your world and in your life? And what is, why has Harvard program decided to study it and measure it and look at it? Yeah, that's a great question and very good to be with all of you tonight. The way that we talk about human flourishing is actually quite broad. We say that it's all aspects of a person's life going well. And we all know that life is complicated. There are many aspects to our life, but the general direction of flourishing is that all aspects of a person's life are going well, which is a great definition, but how do you study that? And so at our group, we break it down into six domains where we look at different aspects of people's lives that are fairly universally held in common and can be studied empirically. So I shall read the list. Uh, the first is happiness and life satisfaction mental health and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, close social relationships, and then financial and material stability. And we would say that this is um, a common and somewhat essential set. We're not saying that there's nothing that has to do with flourishing beyond these six things, but this is one way that we have deployed the study of flourishing in a way that can be looked at empirically. And I think it has resonated because it is, it's fairly simple. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, universal in the sense that we can all nod and be like, yeah, these things more or less do matter um, in different places. And, um, and I think that it's also just a way of simplifying something that can be very big and abstract, like human flourishing. And uh, we've found that that gains traction, not just in academic and science communities, but it does kind of resonate and gain traction beyond our program as well. Cool. So I think a lot of us who come to Wisdom 2.0 are super interested in like this inner life, whatever, yeah. whatever however we kind of name that yeah. and um, explore that. <clears throat> and yet there's this question of like measure, how, how yeah. does somebody actually measure one's inner life? Like it's yes. much easier to measure the external yes. aspects of life. Blood and pressure. so, um, yeah, how do you approach something like this from uh, investigative research, scientific kind of mindset yeah. where there's actually data that we can be, we know it's somewhat trustable. Yeah. It's not like you just caught somebody on a good day. <laughs> Are you happy today? Yeah, I'm happy. Great. You're a 10. Yeah. Um, no, we actually hold two ideas in tension at the same time, which is there is a sense where we will never accomplish perfect measurement. If we're really talking about the transcendent, if we're really talking about the divine, then there's going to be a sense of mystery there that that if we can fully get our hands around it, maybe we don't really have the it. And at the same time, just because we can't achieve perfect measurement uh, does not mean that we shouldn't try. And we shouldn't constantly be looking at the way that we think about the religious, the spiritual, the transcendent aspect of people's lives and try to assess what that is. Because if we're not asking those questions, if we're not exploring it empirically, then it's absent from the conversation. And that's a real loss because I, I'm imagining most people in this room would say, this is an important element of the human experience. And if we don't approach it empirically, if we don't try we're not going to be learning with that in lockstep with the other things that we're learning about the human experience. And actually, a piece of work that um, I'm involved with quite a bit is at these intersections of spirituality, religion, and health, and trying to thread a needle that says this matters, and that empirical research can actually help and facilitate conversations in new ways. It, sometimes we kind of create this, like, science and religion or science and faith and as these like totally opposed things when in fact I mean if we listen to the last conversation I felt nothing but awe there's a way that actually science and good empirical work can usher us into this new um, dimension of consideration and possibility and wonder and we see that a lot now I come from a public health world and when we're thinking about population health the spiritual aspect of life was not really like a key thing that we touched on, but actually there are thousands of studies and hundreds of incredibly high quality studies just in the last 20, 30 years alone that really point to these strong intersections, that there is a huge impact of the spiritual 
on people's health and well-being. And we maybe can't get our hands fully around it all the time. Good research always creates more questions, but we can learn a lot mm -hmm. about what happens when people participate in religious communities to their health and well-being. And another really interesting area is what happens at the end of life or in times of very serious illness, the kinds of spiritual needs that people experience and, and how can we facilitate and serve those from right. a public health, population health perspective? How can science explore those things with, with more curiosity? So there was a global flourishing study, yes. I believe. Yes. And we would love to know, are we flourishing? <laughs> are we not flourishing? <laughs> we'll get what's, back to you. What's the state of the world <laughs> in terms of flourishing currently? Yes, good question. <laughs> Um, so yes, we, um, our group just engaged in this huge initiative called the Global Flourishing Study that is totally a partnership act all the way. Um, our program is a, a big piece of that as well as um, a group from Baylor at the um, Institute for the Studies of Religion and the two PIs come from those institutions, Tyler Vanderwill and Byron Johnson, along with Gallup and the Center for Open Science. And the aspiration is to say, if we really think that these are universally held ideas and values and that it's pointed in the direction of human flourishing, well, we should test that. Yeah. And we shouldn't just do it here in a North American context, we should do it all over the world. And so we've taken on a fairly large challenge, and I am just but one of many, many researchers a part of this, where we are actually following 200,000 people, over 200,000 people in 22 countries for over five years. And it's very expensive and hard oh, to do this, yeah. I will say, yeah, because yeah, people, yeah. I change my number. I don't, you can't find me. <laughs> and we have to follow all of these people. And this is where Gallup is just a critical partner in this. Oftentimes groups will come and they'll ask the same kinds of questions to different people. They'll repeat the questions with different people. And that makes it really hard to make these connections that longitudinal data studies over time can show us. And so the Global Flourishing Study is trying to fill that gap asking lots of questions about these dimensions of the human experience so that we can learn. And we're careful to say, this isn't to say that this country is doing fabulous and this country isn't. We actually expect some really surprising and nuanced mm -hmm. results where we say, wow, the, this part of the world flourishes really uh, in extraordinary ways. What can we learn? This part of the world is flourishing in extraordinary ways. What can we learn? How can we create and kind of push the dial to the direction of what we would call global human flourishing. And what, have you had any of the data to, to analyze yet, we, or is it still, where is the, what's the status of that? We just got, if there's, are there any researchers in the house? <laughs> yeah, okay. We just got our first wave of data in February, and so we are in the thick okay. of this first round of analysis. So if we come back next year to Wisdom 2.0, <laughs> we will have new and very interesting things to say. And of course, this is just wave one, so we can't really yeah. do the cool causal kind of stuff you can do as this study takes place over time. This so year is the... looking at like, what's their economic situation? Yes. What's the sense of safety in their family? Yes, or what yes. Is their... Family connections, um, paternal, maternal, the parent, love of parent, mm -hmm. sense of security, sense of political voice, mm -hmm. loneliness, anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. um, forgiveness, which is a really interesting wow. idea to study. And then of course, our flourishing questions. So how do you feel about your life satisfaction? How happy are you? What's your mental health like? What's your physical, what's your social connections like? Where do you glean meaning and purpose? And these are the kinds of things that I think will really shed light. We also ask a number of questions about people's religion, spirituality, if they have one, just to kind of contextualize what we're learning. So at the hope of, at the end of this, hopefully, we would have a better understanding from a globe. Yes of what are the characteristics that actually encourage a sense of flourishing in one's life? Yes. A feeling of expansion or growth? Yes, not just where is flourishing, but what leads to flourishing. And I think that's a really important question. I think that will help um, our, our policymakers, our government leaders, yeah. our civic leaders to say, oh, you know, this isn't gonna answer all the questions, but this really might help us m take meaningful steps to promote flourishing around the world. Do you think like we could have like a whole institute, well, in the government, <laughs> we could have like a chief flourishing, uh, Maybe. like a surgeon general, but yeah. flourishing? Yes. <laughs> Yes, maybe from someone in this room. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> if we're dealing with loneliness, right, at that yeah. level, why not take it on and say, okay, we see, and this is the like beauty of- Like the Joint of, Chiefs of Staff, but yes. human flourishing. Yes, yes. it would be a really exciting room to be in. Um, no, I think so. And, and th this conversation is not to at all mute the pain and suffering in the world. It's actually to say, 
um, we see that and we want to contribute to, to yeah. the good. We yeah. want to be a part of these efforts. And this is a massive group. I'm just one of many mm -hmm. who are a part of this. We, we want to contribute to, to learning about the good things mm -hmm. so that we can be promoting those strategically and wisely in yeah. the world we live in. Yeah, and I, I can't let this go, but if we have a Department of Defense that yeah. has a certain budget. <laughs> <laughs> what if we had a Department of Flourishing? Any policymakers in the room? Yeah. Should we take this on today? Anyways, yeah, we'll see if that happens. And so, <laughs> um, has this impacted you at all personally? Being involved in this study, has there been any shifts that you've made, <clears throat> or insights or clarities yeah. of your own personal life as you've looked at the lives of other people? Yeah, you know, I think we were talking earlier about um, having children and how that changes you. And I've had three in the last several years, and um, three in the last several years. Well, my oldest is six, so okay, okay. six and down, six, okay. <clears throat> almost six. Um, and, you know, I think when you have children, it, it does make you more thoughtful about the world you live in and the world you're helping to create. And I, it's, it has, I think, f firmed my grounding in this and saying this, this matters. It doesn't just matter so that I have a fancy CV. It matters because I want them to live in a world that is good and that has opportunity for all people to flourish. And then I think the other thing is that um, when you're a new parent, you're just really tired and <laughs> like, stretched thin. And it could be really easy to toss some of the practices that I think are actually sacred in our lives. Because it's like, who has the time to sit up and breathe right? Um, <laughs> um, or these other things that can truly enrich and anchor us. And, um, and even with young children, beginning to do that in, in yeah. family life is really important. So I think I would have discarded some of that a little easier if it wasn't for this research to remind me like, this isn't, this isn't like a sidebar. It's, it's an essential part of what it means to be human. And lastly, how do you think we create a movement that supports m more awareness of the inner life? Mm. Like with kids today, we grade them on everything but their inner life. Yeah. It's like, right? Like <laughs> how good can you memorize yeah. math skills? It's all fine and dandy. And can you, you know, regurgitate this book that you read. Yeah. But like the inner life sometimes mm. is just not something that is kind of part of what we, what we cultivate with them or yeah. even tell them is important. Right. And so um, I'm curious if you have thoughts and maybe the mm. study will help move that conversation forward. Well, I do think good research plays a role in that, you know, and I, I, I do understand there can be a little bit of a cringe, like, oh, you're going to put numbers to something that's just so sacred. And, yeah, and I get that. Yeah, it, it can feel a little reductive. But at the same time, if we I think that doing this kind of work um, allows for these topics to even be considered yeah. in policy um, yeah. rooms. I've seen how it creates space in the classroom mm -hmm. to talk about ideas that are a little bit off limits or like, oh, we're going to talk about that. And like, yeah, because the data says. And, and I think um, that's a part of it. Yeah. But honestly, I think it really does um, show up the most in our own lives. So it can't just be something we research and study and then go off and pretend it doesn't matter. I think that's a way of cultivation that we both have to it's a little bit the whole, the whole person here. It's, it's mind, body, yeah. spirit, and we have to practice it ourselves so our kids see. Yeah. They're they watching watch us. us more they than watch they're us. listening to us. They watch us. So we have to live it out. Well, I hope you guys can keep coming back and, yeah. and updating yes. us on what it actually means to We'll have all the answers what, next year. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll, what, we won't. 200, <laughs> what following 200,000 people in 22 countries over five years, yeah. like, what do we learn from that? Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me.